Welcome to the Podcast for Inquiry, brought to you by the Centre for Inquiry Canada, a national educational charity supporting your community for reason, compassion, and secular humanist values. You have answers, we have questions. I'm your host, Leslie Rosenblatt, board member and secular chair for CFIC. Welcome. My guest today on Podcast for Inquiry is David Good. He is a member of the Yanomami tribe, an author, explorer, filmmaker, and founder of The Good Project. He is currently a PhD student in microbiology at the University of Guelph. His research focuses on characterizing the gut microbiome of Yanomami communities still living a traditional lifestyle of hunting, gathering, and gardening. He and the Good Project team conduct expeditions to Yanomami territory to support programs in health, research, education, and cultural preservation. His unique ancestry and scientific training provide a rare opportunity to advance our understanding of the human microbiome while providing and building global awareness on the importance of protecting these few remaining isolated indigenous societies. He describes what it is like to have one foot in two very different worlds and shares with me the experience of what it was like to meet his mother in the jungle after 20 years of living in suburban America. We talk about the Yanomami equivalent of laws and their means of settling disputes and what we can learn from them. He tells me also about the Good Project and the importance of protecting the Yanomami way of life from encroachment from the Western world. It's a fascinating conversation, and without further ado, I present to you my discussion with David Good. Okay, David Good, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me on Podcast for Inquiry. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So you're a, you're a bit of a, a, a unique person, uh, but before we get into your personal story, we're going to be talking um, a fair amount about the uh, Yanomami today. And sure. not everyone knows who the Yanomami are. So can you, can you just give us a little bit of background and, and tell us a bit about the Yanomami, and then we'll get into your connection to them. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, uh, you know, to put it uh, for a quick summary, the Yanomami are a group of hunter-gatherers and small-scale gardeners that reside in the Amazon rainforest. Their territory spans between uh, um, the Venezuelan and Brazilian border. And uh, they are largely known uh, and popularized throughout the world as one of the world's last um, relatively isolated um, traditional uh, indigenous groups. And um, while there is a sort of um, a dynamic range of, uh, of you know, of, of levels of contact and, and cultural change within their population, but there are uh, many communities that, um, that many claim that are still very, very isolated with no contact with the outside world. Um, uh, very, uh, they are a group that largely subsists through hunting gathering with the bow and arrow, and they fish and garden for plantains and tobacco. Uh, traditionally, they don't they have a counting system that is just one, two, and many. Uh, there's no written language, no calendar. So, you know, for many of the Yanomami people, there's no 2022, there's no 1985, and um, there's no Monday or weekend or year or month. And everything that they need is extracted from the surrounding rainforest. And they live in this communal structure known as the Shabanos, uh, uh, comprised of anywhere from 50 to 250 inhabitants, um, divided up between two or three lineages. So that's sort of the, uh, the, sh- the short summary of who the Yanomami are. Okay. So uh, talk to me a little bit about, the, about these Shabanos, like this, what, what life is like uh, in, in these communities of between 50 and, and, and 250 people. And sure. How it, how it would differ, for example, like, you know, here in Canada, we have very small, we would call them villages probably, mm-hmm. uh, with, with where the, there's, there's settlements of very, of, of a small number of people of between 250 and 250. Uh, but I imagine that life in a Canadian small village would be quite different than in a Chabonneau. So can you, can you talk about what, what it's like, sort of a compare and contrast? Yeah, sort of just a regular day in the life of a Yanomama. 
Um, one thing I like to, to say, um, just to preface this, is that my experience, as I described, this Yanomami is based on um, sort of a snapshot in time and, and, and based on, you know, my particular community, my village. Um, you know, what I describe in the Yanomami Shabano in the Venezuelan side of things could be very different in Brazil. It'll be very different near the mission compounds. It's, um, you know, they, there's Yanomami that have different geographies, different levels of contact. Some, you know, some have, you know, access to Western and uh, goods and so on. I just wanted to preface this just to ensure that, like, what I say is not uh, sort of a generalization of all Yanomami people. But in my, you know, community that, that I go to, you know, it's uh, in, the, in the Amazon, we're two and a half degrees north of the equator. So 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours of sunlight. Um, climate, you know, it's hot, it's jungle. Uh, you know, there's rainy season, dry season, but although it just rains a lot all year round. Um, so when you wake up in the morning, you know, you're, you're in your hammock. So everyone sleeps in their hammock uh, and they uh, triangulate their hammock around the fire to keep warm at night because the jungle is pretty cold. So everyone wakes up, and um, basically, what's everyone on? Uh, what's on everyone's mind is what are we going to eat for the day? So um, you know, the men will go out and hunt, uh, or maybe they need to go tend the gardens, or maybe they need to chop down a tree, or maybe they need to go fishing. The women will do other things like collecting plantains or harvesting, you know, tobacco leaves. Uh, oftentimes, the women will go uh, uh, crabbing, you know, together in the creeks. So it's never never boring in the jungle, especially since you know you're hungry. <laughs> so what do you got to do? You got you have to eat. But that's that's sort of their job. That's their you know occupation, and, and you always do that communally with your family, and um, and so you're never alone. So it's, you always have that great sense of you know familial connection, community, whenever any and ever all tasks that you do. And then generally, uh, the kids, you know, are naked, you know, uh, running around, playing in the dirt, in the water. Um, you know, maybe the boys are learning how to shoot their bows and arrows. Maybe the girls are learning how to weave baskets. Um, and perhaps, uh, you know, some of the men stayed behind to practice their shamanic chants to commune with the spirits. So there's quite a lot of hustle and bustle in, in, a, in a typical Yanomami uh, village. And then generally around midday, um, uh, you, you know, the, you'll come back because, you know, the, the equatorial sun is very strong and you want to seek shelter underneath the Shabano roof and you'll cook, cook whatever fish you collected or, you know, cook up some plantains and, um, and then you just continue on with other tasks and that may involve, you know, continue working on baskets or making new arrowheads and so on or um, continuing to smoke your meat or, or continuing to, you know, practice your shamanic chants. Um, gender roles are, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty, pretty straightforward. You know, it's usually the men that hunt, chop down the trees. Um, it's usually the women that um, will, will collect plantains um, or go crabbing or in the village in, in the creek. But even though there's, you know, kind of straightforward gender roles, <laughs> either one is it's very hard, you know, very hard work living in the jungle. So it's, it's you know, life in the jungle is, is simple, but it's hard. And everyone pulls their weight, you know, no matter how young or how old. Um, and, and you have this sort of f this communal kind of feeling of, you know, doing what you're doing is for the betterment of the community and the village. Um, and everything they do is based on a life of reciprocity. You know, if you collect, if you hunt something, you bring it back, you distribute that meat with your friends and family or your family in the village. And then maybe on another day, someone else will come back with a, you know, with a monkey or a peccary or whatever, and they'll distribute that meat with you. So I really like that about the Yanomami, you know, society and the way of life. And, um, and, and then sometimes, uh, um, because the Yanomami are semi-nomadic, um, interestingly, they don't s traditionally settle in one area because the Amazonian terrain is not fertile for long-term agriculture. So their uh, gardens will go fallow after two or three years. So they're constantly moving around the forest, you know, either tending new gardens or starting new gardens. And that's always an interesting part of their culture because that's you're, you're trekking through the jungles and um, finding new food, you know, always on the task of hunting, finding food. Um, and then at other times uh, when they're completely out of food or game, they'll revert back to their traditional hunt and gathering and just simply go on a Wayumi, which is an extended trek through the jungle. They'll just abandon their village altogether and just trek for weeks and weeks or maybe months upon months, you know, into the wandering around the forest, looking for a new home or looking for more food. Um, so that, that, that's, uh, again, it's just snapshot. I could go on and on and on, but it's, uh, you know, really, you know, and, and that, and that's the, you know, good things. There's a lot of, 
you know, kind of not so nice things. You got the mosquitoes, you got the gnats, you know, always watching out for poisonous snakes. And sometimes it's uh, not safe to be out in the forest when, there, you know, a, a, a big rainstorm comes and you have falling branches and trees. So, you know, life in the jungle is, is can be dangerous at times. So you have your positive and your, you know, it's a, and your negatives and pros and cons. Uh, certainly different than life in Canada. <laughs> it sounds it, yeah. You have a possibly unique connection to the Yanomami. Why don't you uh, tell me about that and, and why you know so much? Because it doesn't sound like this, uh, what you're describing comes from books. Yeah, or, or from ethnographic research, right? Well, yeah, I'm Yanomami. <laughs> so I'm son of a Yanomami woman named uh, Yarima. Uh, I um, identify myself as a member of the Irokai Teri, which is um, an indigenous, uh, which is a Yanomami village. Uh, that is located uh, above the Guajaripo Rapids in the uh, upper Orinoco region of Venezuela. And they are one of the more remote communities, um, especially since uh, the majority of the time they don't live on the Orinoco River. They like to move inland. And um, traditionally, the Yanomami are inland people. It's only a recent phenomenon that s villages have permanently settled along the Orinoco River. And so that is my connection. Yeah, I'm Yanomami. The Amazon's my home. And so when I go down there to do research or go down there to engage in various projects, I'm also going back to my homeland to be with my mom and my family and and to um, you know learn more about my indigenous heritage and surviving in the in the Amazon rainforest. You know, I'm not a warrior like my mom, but you know, I am you know making that you know dedication to learn the ways of my ancestors. If I uh... Remember your your book correctly. You you were born in the Amazon rainforest, and you spent your first few years there. Actually, I was I was just born up here. You know, uh, my mother was uh, about eight months pregnant, a little more than eight months pregnant when she arrived to the United States. Oh, so I was born. Yeah, my sister was born. You know, down in the Amazon. You as a young child, you spent some time in in the rainforest. Yes, uh, with, with with your mom. How and and then, um, and then you came back to the United States and then you were in the United States for like 20 years or so and and then yeah. and then returned only as a as a young adult in your early to mid mid 20s and I think you've been back a few times since so mm -hmm. can you tell us what it's like to have a foot in in both worlds yeah well I have a, a, a as an infant toddler <laughs> you know young child and then as a young adult and now in my you know um you know older years but I can tell you that I always feel pulled you know there's this siren call to go back to the Amazon because you know obviously that's where my whole mother's side of the family and I have people that I love and care about um, and uh, the Amazon, you know, given its dangers, is a, a beautiful, wonderful place. And, you know, there, like my father's experience, I don't, it's a, you just, this, this sort of the burdens and stressors of Western society just sort of disappear. And you realize that I am, you know, this human being that is in perfect, you know, harmony with my surrounding ecosystem. And I have this family, a mother, a brother, aunts and uncles to help me, you know, go through this journey together and surviving, you know, um, you know, well, to me, it's surviving, but to them, it's just life. It's just living, finding food. So the act of, you know, catching a fish or killing a monkey or, or harvesting plantains, you know, it has so much meaning to it. Um, and when I'm up here in Western world, you know, I, where we have this sort of individualistic lifestyle and you have stress and, and, you know, and sometimes you're, you don't eat the best foods or drink the best things. And it all kind of, these stressors kind of compile up to where you feel like you're in this state of, you know, chronic inflammation. <laughs> um, but then when I'm down there with my family, yeah, I confess I miss this world because, you know, um, the main reason is that the Amazon is under threat, it's under attack, and obviously if I just spend the rest of my life in the jungle, I wouldn't be doing what I feel is my part as as the only member of my community, um, other than my siblings, to be, to have raised in Western society, to be educated in Western society, and then to be able to navigate, um, you know, the, 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 um, uh, acquiring resources and support to help protect my family in the Amazon rainforest. So I do feel pulled, you know, oftentimes between two worlds, and, and it can be difficult. <laughs> I, I, I 
read in your book that uh, shortly after you, you you met your mother as a young adult when you went back in your in your twenties, uh, she presented you with with two wives. And said, "Congratulations, you now have yeah, right. you now have these two these two wives." But that has a different meaning in the Yanomami than it does here. Sure. We, like we're, I, I'm using the word wives because I speak I, I speak English, and that has a very uh, specific meaning uh, in English in this in, in, in Canadian yeah. society. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure what the Yanomami equivalent word is, but the concept is is quite different. So uh, I'm curious. Like, what's your relationship uh, with your two wives today? <laughs> but before before you answer that, uh, can you explain what that relationship with uh, with with what these women means? Like, what what being married to uh, yeah or, or, or yes. have, having a wife means in Yanomami, and contrast that with you know this standard right. Canadian nuptials. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's sometimes it's difficult to explain, and there's a lot of ba- context that I have to offer, right? Because, I, you know, I don't want everyone going around and saying, "Oh my gosh, David Good's a polygamist," you know. So, <laughs> you know, maybe wife is not the best term. You know, maybe it's partner, maybe it's I don't know. But you know, in 2011, when I first you know found my mother after not seeing her for 20 years, um, I had this Western notion. I was raised in the Western world, brought up by Disney. I was brought up by all these books. So like my idea of love and marriage and affection is just like any other person in that, in, in suburban New Jersey in the United States. So um, anyway, when I was introduced to these two women and they, I was told that these are my wives, I was just in, in complete culture shock. I said, well, I, I don't, what does that mean? And, and, you know, and I feel like, mom, you know, it's been 20 years, but geez, can we like slow down with the whole wife thing? <laughs> so, um, but then, you know, after I spent more and more years and learning about, you know, not just learning about Yanomama culture, but like the psyche of a Yanomami and what it means to be Yanomami. And what I recognize is that because, you know, I have blood, I have Yanomami blood, that is like the most important thing for a Yanomami village or community. I am a member of that community, you know, it is not my decision, you know, I'm not the one saying that I'm Yanomami, they are telling me I'm Yanomami because of Yanomami blood. And therefore, I'm automatically plugged into this, you know, very complex kinship network that I'm still learning myself you know, aunts, uh, cousins, brothers, half brothers, you know, and learning it within the context of the Yanomami genealogy and kinship network. And lo and behold, I had no idea that, you know, because I'm plugged into this kinship network, I automatically, even before I arrived, had a wife or or two wives. And um, so it was really complex for me to understand that. And what was interesting is that I thought it was like something like a kind of like a half joke and maybe like, okay, whatever, maybe, maybe it's like, ha ha ha, whatever. But then as the years went by, um, the, the women, you know, and my mother con- continually reminded me that like, these are, these are your wives. So you have little certain extra obligations, like bringing extra, uh, uh, um, maybe an extra machete or a knife or an ax head or an, a skirt just for them. But uh, in addition to that, however, you know, my mother was really sort of kind of reprimanding for not performing my husbandly duties by giving her grandchildren. (laughs) And, you know, and I and that's another, you know, kind of intercultural dilemma that I'm in that, you know, my community, my village, my family, my own mother expects me to, you know, have children with them and. And and having children in the Yanomami community is not like here where, you know, you need to have lots of money and all these, you know, kind of resources needed to raise a child down there. You just need it. You just need the village. It takes a village to raise a child and all you need is a village to raise a child. And they, you know, my mom didn't care if I left, you know, for years at a time or whatever. That that doesn't mean anything. The idea of like a, an absentee father or whatever, it has a different, con- you know, connotation down there. But still, nevertheless, you know, I, I, I saw my quote unquote wives as, you know, more as like friends because they were actually very helpful in helping me teach, learn the language, how to, you know, um, cer- develop certain skills in the Amazon, how to survive. So, you know, the, the answer is I never really in my Western psyche state of mind, never really saw them as my, you know, quote unquote wife, but more as like good friends. And um, then I kind of tease and joke around, you know, saying like, you know, hey, wife, I'm thirsty. I need some water today or something like that. And they they get they laugh, they, they laugh and, and everything. And it's 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 a lot. It's fun. It's fun. Um, 
you know, interestingly enough, my wives have husbands. So, you know, that that's another thing that I'm learning, you know, uh, about m the complexity of, you know, my position as one half Yanomami and also one half Naba. And Naba means outsider. So, you know, it's no secret that my family recognizes that me being a Naba, I have certain access to resources, certain access to, you know, um, you know, goods that they cannot get on their own. And that's pots and pans and machetes and fish hooks and fish lines. And these are things that really they covet because it helps them acquire food. You know, they're not they're not asking for cell phones or radios or TVs. They're just very basic steel goods that help improve, you know, their quality of life and their ability to fish and garden and so on. So by having a wife and having quote unquote children, if I were to have children, I would have this sort of additional obligation to support my community. Although I would never, you know, I, they always have my support and my love. So every time I go down there, of course, I always bring bring these goods as gifts for them. And uh, yeah, I mean, we could <laughs> we could grab a couple of beers and keep talking about this for another hour. It's very <laughs> very complex situation. Well, I mean, I, yeah, on on one level, yes, it's definitely complex. But it's good to know that there are certain universals, and that that like a parent wants uh, wants grandchildren. Yeah, that's uh, exactly. <laughs> that's right, certainly something yeah. that uh, uh, I think that that uh, we all have we all have in common <laughs> something that I'm, I'm i'm curious about and that i didn't i didn't get from from your book is uh whether or how the yanomami have have laws or what the equivalent of of laws would be and how mm -hmm. they're enforced and uh i would imagine that that, that yanomami being being people there are jerks, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? They, yeah. And, and to take to take an extreme example, and, and, and just you know, we, you know, if uh, if someone is a is a murderer here, mm -hmm. we have police and courts and and jails when everything is working properly, and we physically remove someone that kills other people from society and put them in a place where they can't harm others after mm -hmm. after due process. And I'm assuming that. At least these things are, are possible. That there are a small number of uh, of people, but how how the Yanunami society, how the tribes like, deal with rule breakers or, or like genuinely antisocial behaviors sure. are, are are dealt with. And I was hoping that maybe you could provide some insight on that because I'm fascinated by Abs how different yeah. societies handle these <laughs> these very real problems because they're made up of people. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so uh, I can share with you, you know, based on my experience and what I've learned through the text, but highly recommend, you know, reading something from, you know, reading my father's book or even a Shagnon's book to, to look at, you know, the, the, the structure of, of society and how they deal with that. Yeah. So give us the title of, of your father's book and of Shagnon's book so that so that, you know, we can we can do that reading if we want. Absolutely. And, you know, my, my, my work, you know, among the Yanomami deals with biological research where my father is an anthropologist. So he, you know, he deals with ethnographic research. So he has quite a bit of insight. His book is uh, Into the Heart um, by Kenneth Gooden uh, with David Chanoff. And, you know, it's a memoir that talks about his uh, love and knowledge uh, uh, among the Yanomama. And that's how he met my mother and married my mother and so on. So you can really get a deep dive into that history. Um, Shagnon, who was, you know, the, the late uh, Napoleon Shagnon, who was quite controversial, you know, controversial, uh, um, you know, he has this book called the uh, uh, Yanomama, the Fierce People, um, or, you know, now the Yanomama, um, uh, and it's based on his ethnographic, you know, research among the Yanomami in the 60s and 70s. So, um, you know, these are great scientists, and, and so I would, you know, recommend them. Among many others, you know, you have Jacques Rizot and so on, but you can just Google them, right, these days. Um, so, uh, but, you know, I can sort of summarize that there are no, no laws, right? There's no sort of uh, um, uh, jury or sort of body, governing body. You know, the Yanomami are this egalitarian society. It's where there's no stratification of power. Um, so there is a headman, and the headman is sort of kind of the leader, but he's only leader because he's a great orator, a great shaman. Uh, you know, he's a great hunter. He has a way of uh, words to be able to, you know, negotiate political, um, you know, agreements with other Yanomami Shabanos and so on. Uh, and, and and he's only headman because the village, you know, uh, 
uh, trusts him and, and pretty much he allows him to be headman, but he doesn't get any extra powers or any extra, you know, perks for being headman. He still has to hunt, still has to fish. He has to do all these things just like any other villager. So it's a position of additional responsibility and maybe a little bit of prestige, but no extra perks. Absolutely. Yeah, no real, no big major extra perks, you know, you know, not like being a, a mayor or a chief or, a, you know, or, or any of those things or an overlord or a president or anything like that. Um, so, so, but there are um, transgressions, you know, obviously, <laughs> you know, people get angry. And interesting enough, and I'm glad you brought this, is that, you know, the Shabano, the, the village is a circular, a circular village, which has a thatch roof and opening in the middle. And it has this sort of, you know, lattice network of poles and sticks, and and that's where they uh, hang their hammocks around the fire. But when the population grows, the village doesn't grow. The village structure doesn't grow. So if that doesn't grow, that means the density increases. So if you add more and more people living under the same roof, obviously you're going to increase the chances of having some kind of conflict. And those conflicts can range anywhere from just annoying each other to stealing each other's plantains, which is a grave offense, right? Because that's that's you know that's a lot of work, you know, making those, uh, growing those plantains. You can have infidelity, sleeping with someone's wife. You can have arguments over you know various things. So you know the level of these transgressions, um, you know, depend, you know, can or correlate with with the population size. Um, so anyway. Uh, uh, oftentimes, uh, they'll engage in a chest pounding duel. So there's two, two people that face each other and they kind of, you know, paint themselves up with the war paint and they exchange blows to the chest. And oftentimes, you know, or most of the times, if not all the times, it's, it's between two men and, um, and, you know, you have two, two sides of the family hurling insults at each other, yelling at each other and so on. And, 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 uh, and whoever, you know, falls to the ground ends up quote unquote losing the battle and and for the most part based on what i read and what i've experienced you know uh they can that's a way of um though it looks violent but i think it's a means of preventing violence because no one's that you know one gets killed they let out their anger um oftentimes they'll just like make up towards the end you know just as long as they don't keep repeating those transgressions um and other times they can engage in you know club duels where they you know uh, exchange blows to the head which could split your head open and and and, and um, so on um, very you know rarely does it result in a death but if it does result in a death then you have this much more highly elevated you know and complex complicated situation where the Yanomami um, have to uh, avenge the death and will do a, you know a revenge, a revenge raid or a revenge killing and it could spark a continuous cycle and in that case, you know, the, the the oftentimes a village will split apart and fission, and and to the point where you know they're far enough away where they may not attack each other, or to the point where, um, you know, the uh, um, they come to a certain the, the the it comes to a certain you know stable level where they're not exchanging raids. Um, and again, this is a very complex, you know, ex uh, situation and explanation, but, um, and, and, and everything in between, you know, they, it could happen, there could be peace for 20 years, but down the road, uh, you know, there could be a spark or a new argument or a new fight and they would, you know, could engage in a, in a, in another duel or another raid. So, uh, you know, via the violence aspect of Yanomami culture is very interesting, you know, how, how you know, hunter-gathering societies like the Yanomami, you know, um, handle transgressions uh, from, from, the, from the smallest to the gravest. Um, but I just don't want to, like my father, don't want to make the mistake of painting them as this sort of, you know, savage, you know, brutal-like people because none of them has ever dropped nuclear bombs or killed mass-killed people or, you know what I mean, or, or you know, use, uh, use power to... <laughs> I, yeah, I think, yeah. It's, I think it's fair to say that anything other than a pure <laughs> pacifist society is therefore must be completely brutal. Like there's... Right, there's, there's yeah, a, yeah. There's an enormous spectrum of... Uh, Absolutely. And I, you know, I apologize for being defensive like that, but it's a big part of uh, the controversy in Yanomami history. So, you know, a book like Darkness in El Dorado by Patrick Tierney will give you a great picture of the, 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 the deep and dark controversy surrounding, you know, the Yanomami people regarding their violence. Yeah. Okay. So let, I'll, I'll shift away from, from, from that and uh, something a little bit more personal. At one point, uh, you decided to try Yopo. 
Yeah. So, can you tell me what Yopo is and what that experience was like for you? Yeah, it's so Yopo basically is a um, an entheogen, you know, which is a, a substance that you take to um, a, a, a usually hallucinogenic substance that you imbibe to um, alter your senses so that you for some spiritual reason. Um, you know, I'm sure you've heard of ayahuasca, you know, even LSD and so on. But the Yanomami, uh, um, uh, it's a, a, a take yopo, which is which is a powder derived from the ebony seed. Um, and uh, um, this seed is, is, is harvested from the pods. It's dried out in the sun and it's mixed with a specific bark from a, a, of a particular tree and, and, and it's grind down to a powder. And, um, this, and they have this uh, uh, like this sort of two, meter long tube where one end is tapered. Uh, so you take the tapered end, you put it up your nostril and then at the other end, you pack about a tablespoon of this powder. And then a shaman will just, you know, blast oh. this powder straight into your nasal cavity. And so what was interesting is, you know, and, and, and then, you know, the, the uh, you have, um, it's a DMT derivative um, and, and it's a and beautiful tenant. So those are the two main psychoactive compounds that, you know, that um, allow the shaman to enter the spirit world to commune with the spirits. And I remember, you know, I, and this happens on a daily basis. So in my, my community, there's somebody always taking Yopo. You always hear chants every day. And, um, and, and this is also how they heal the sick. And this is how they, you know, even wage war against other villages. They'll contact spirits, attack, a, you know, a, a, an enemy village in the spirit realm and so on. So, but this is how they bring upon rain. And this is how they, you know, on and on and on. Well, you know, I'm sitting in my hammock and, you know, it's just another day in the Yanomami life. I'm writing in my journal and then uh, my brother summons me and he has this pole in his hand. I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, and then I look at mom and mom is like, you know, looking at me like, you have to do this, son. <laughs> it's your time. And he, she's pushing me, egging me on. I'm like, OK. And uh, it was very, I was very nervous. Um, uh, uh, we went, we, we, we didn't, you know, join the shamans. We just kind of you know, stayed along the side. And, and then, yeah, my brother just blasted my nasal cavity with hit after hit after hit of the, of the yopo. And it was, you know, painful, very painful. And, you know, you can't help, but, you know, the, 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 um, the snot is, you know, flowing down out of your nose and, and you're feeling the pain, but then it hits you. And, and all of a sudden, you know, you don't feel, you don't feel pain. So you don't feel like the bite of the mosquito or the gnats anymore. And the sun, you know, isn't as, as, you know, uh, uh, abrasive and, and, and similar to other experiences, you kind of feel like this connection to like the, 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 the this sort of un, unseen network of veins and arteries of the rainforest with the trees and the leaves and, and um and you sort of have like this you know transcendent experience where i don't you know you don't see an actual door but it's like a, a you know it's like a feeling where you're about to enter the spirit world and um and uh so you know I, it's not like you walk through a portal but you just sort of enter this different realm and then that that was my first time trying yopo um and then i i stopped because i you know um I've never taken, you know, something like that before. And I was very nervous about, you know, just absolutely losing myself in the jungle, like taking my clothes off and just like running into the forest and never coming back. <laughs> so, um, so I didn't find my quote unquote spirit animal, which they call the Hekura. And, you know, the Hekura um, uh, are, are what you call upon to, you know, in the spirit world to, 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 you know, um, do various things. And, um, and, uh, so hopefully, you know, my next trip, which I, you know, endeavor to find my spirit animal. I, I'd like to ask a little bit about the contact with, of the Yanomami with the, with the outside, with the outside world. So sure. based, based on your book, there seem to be, uh, essentially three groups that, uh, that, that have regular contact. Uh, one is the, the government of Venezuela or representatives mm -hmm. of the government of Venezuela or, or, or Brazil, uh, because, mm -hmm. you know, they're large, they're in that territory that the young might have sort of, uh, live their own lives there. Mm -hmm. uh, the second group are essentially outside scientists, anthropologists, biologists, like, not like you, but somewhat like you uh, in your sure, role as yeah. a biologist. And then <laughs> you mentioned them frequently in your book, but don't actually, they, 
they don't actually do much, at least in, in your description. And that's the, mm-hmm. those are the missionaries, uh, primarily mm-hmm. Catholic, although you re- refer to a couple Protestants here and there. And as, but aside from just having boats, uh, yeah. uh, I, I, there's no interactions described. So yeah. okay. uh, I, I was, uh, are, are there other groups that regularly interact or is that, does that pretty much cover it? Ooh. And what, what are relations like these, these, uh, like shamanic beliefs and in the spirit mm-hmm. world, obviously that's uh, quite a different perspective on the afterlife or, or, or life outside of the material world than Christianity has. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly Christianity has a very long and violent history within South America. So I'm yeah. wondering what relations are like between the Yanomami and anthropologists and, uh, uh, and government officials and, and Christian missionaries. Yeah, and you know that's yeah. I, I do get asked that a lot, and, and it's a it's a it's a loaded question because it's you know a very long and deep and dark history. You know where each of these entities, in one form or another, have you know gravely exploited the Yanomami people, have negatively you know affected their culture, impacted their way of life. Um, so you know, I don't. I'm not going to denounce any one of these things, but you know, we do have to recognize that you know, long before Westerners and outsiders came, the Yanomami have developed a way of life that has sustained themselves. They were able to live and survive generation after generation without negatively impacting their ecosystem. Um, so they are the world's best conservationists. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm sorry I didn't describe too much in my book, uh, only because maybe because some of these missionaries are my friends and I do work with them. So the two main missionaries are the Salesians and the Protestants. Um, and, you know, the, the, uh, they have different different methods and ways of engaging with the, the Yanomami people, but they are very, uh, very much involved. They live there all day, every day. You know, they're in the jungle and, and they engage with the Yanomami, not just in sort of, you know, in, in a in, at the level of proselytizing, you know, but also they they are very much involved with um, the, the school structures and, and and facilitating medical teams when there's outbreaks of diseases and so on. So, um, and I think one thing we should point that the you know the idea of missionary work in the 60s and 70s and those kinds of people that made con- first contact with the Yanomami has evolved quite a bit. They're much more progressive and open-minded, you know, um, here in, in the in the the second decade of the 2000s. So, um, yeah, so you have the missionaries, you have researchers, and you have, you know, government personnel, and then, of course, you know, the medical teams and so on that go down there when there's outbreaks of diseases like measles and tuberculosis and so on, malaria. Um, and it's it's very, very dynamic. You know, some, some Yanomami communities will absolutely refuse, you know, any type of scientist because, Unfortunately, um, historically, you know, this concept of, of uh, parachute science, um, you know, where they come in, uh, they take samples or they conduct research, whether be it ethnographic, if they learn their language or learn their way of life. And they have this, un- they have this side of this, this idea that, you know, these outsiders go back to their, you know, generally European or U.S., you know, homes and they make lots of money, you know, and they use that money, and, but they don't give anything back to the Yanomami people. And, you know, I have to say some of the, they have pretty good, strong arguments. And I think it's true, you know, for a lot of reasons, you know, and, uh, and, and, and I think they're very, very upset. So that has left a culture of great skepticism and, um, and great distrust among, you know, researchers and scientists and even government personnel and, and, and missionaries for a lot of these communities. Um, other times they, you know, uh, they, they have integrated with a lot of the missionaries, for example, they, you know, some have married missionaries and have children with missionaries and, um, and some are, uh, some have become teachers, some have become medics, some have become, you know, um, politicians, you know, the mayor of the Yanomami territory, uh, is Yanomami. And a lot of those, um, you know, and which is all positive, right? Because who should be representing the Yanomami people when it comes to, you know, economic and political policies, when it comes to providing medical resources, it should be the Yanomami themselves. That could not have happened if it weren't for the mission compounds down there. So, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and, and 
to also, as a side note, this has nothing to do with my community. <laughs> so these are the other communities that are downriver that have frequent contact with outsiders. You know, there's no mission compound, you know, where my village is. So, um, but, you know, I do, you know, partake and engage with the villagers that live near missionaries, but I'm not there to disrupt anything. You know, I just want to, I'm there to learn, you know, I'm there and provide, you know, support when I can. So you mentioned earlier that one of the reasons why you don't stay there and that you keep coming back to the Western world is uh, you have access to, to resources and you can have some influence here to make things better for, for your people there. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you had a magic wand and you could, uh, and, and you could like change the reality and 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 kind of you know make the relationship uh, between the Yanomami and and the rest of the world the way you want it to be. What would yeah. it be? What are you trying to accomplish, or what what would you accomplish if you had infinite resources and yeah. and and could reshape the current dynamics into something that is that that is healthier uh, in in your view? What would that look like? What I would like, or at least what I would like to see for my family is could different for a community that lives on a mission. It could be different for the Brazilian Yanomami. So, you know, with that, with that context, um, I think what's first and foremost is to kick out the illegal gold miners. <laughs> I mean, they, you know, um, uh, they uh, are destroying the Amazon rainforest. They're poisoning the waters. They are violently killing Yanomami people. Um, and they're, you know, uh, oftentimes they're being backed by, you know, criminal gangs that are backed by the governments and so on. So, um, you know, and what's clear, you know, now as the reasons why the miners there, that's a very complex, you know, international economic and political, you know, debate, right? You know, um, but nevertheless, it doesn't give them, you know, the right to go in and destroy these lands that the Yanomami have protected for millennia. So those are the very direct things, you know, that I wish uh, I could do. Um, but, you know, if I didn't have a magic wand, that means I have to do it in other ways. And that is building resilience in the Yanomami, ha giving them the tools so that they can adapt. You know, let's face it, they're not, they're not just, they're not the, this, this sort of noble savage, like, you know, majestic image of these noble warriors that live in the rainforest and like animals in a zoo, we should just leave them alone. It's like, no, you know, if they're going to survive and continue their way of life, they need to have the tools and resources so that they can have self-determination, the self-representation on a global scale, not just within their territory. So it needs to be, you know, if the Yanomami want to fight the gold mining, they need to know what is gold mining? What is, what is a human right, right? Because in my village, you know, they don't know what, what is indigenous, right? They don't know, they don't go around saying, hey, I'm an indigenous person. That That's a made up term by us. That's a colonial term that we made up to pose on these people. They don't, Yanomami don't call themselves indigenous. They just say they're Yanomami. But we have to teach them, you know, this history between colonialism and, and post-colonialism and, you know, how people have exploited the resources and what the Amazon means to the world. Um, and we have to, you know, give them the tools to be able to fight back against the Yanomami because they are the, the miners because they're not going to be able to fight back with just bows and arrows, you know, when, when they have machine guns and, and heavy machinery. So um, and that means, you know, developing um, communication infrastructure, um, education, educational resources that can help them learn how to read and write, not only in Spanish, but in Yanomami so that they can engage with political functionaries so that, you know, um, when the time comes that when they have to represent themselves, it's not a non-Yanomami representing them, but an actual, you know, Yanomami representing themselves. So they're learning how to interact and engage and navigate with the Western world. And I think that's necessary. And You've founded something cleverly called the Good Project, <laughs> and I can only assume it's to try and achieve some of these goals. Can you tell me a little bit about the uh, the Good Project and what its uh, what its aims are? Absolutely, and that and that stemmed from so when I found my mother in 2011 and um, in the Amazon after not seeing her for 20 years, 
I had recognized that I was not just a researcher immersing myself, you know, with this, you know, for in these foreign lands with these, you know, unknown people. I these I I was going back home, and this was my family, and and when I saw my village, you know, um, and my kin kin, I really I immediately recognized that um, I'm the only member of this community that can go back home, create a foundation, help, uh, you know, get the resources so that so that I can be part of a movement that protects their way of life. Because similar to my father's experience, these are people that live happily in the forest. They don't have depression. They don't have PTSD. They don't, have, they don't commit suicide. That's just unfathomable to them. And they have the best food security. No, you know, they, everything that they need is surrounded from the rainforest. They have each other. And not only they can do all of those things, and not detrimentally impact the environment, you know, and the ecosystem, because that is their home. They're not, they don't live in the jungle. They are the jungle. They're part of the jungle. There is no separation between us and them and like, oh, I got to go out and be nature today because, you know, my life sucks here because I keep working, you know, 40 plus hours in front of a screen. You know, that doesn't happen. And that's why my father loved that way of life and married my mother, or one of the reasons. And I realized when I looked at my, I remember looking at my niece into her eyes and I feel like, oh my God, like just like this horrible vision of like, you know, alcoholism or diabetes or prostitution coming to these lands because that's what the Western world brings. And I realized this, you know, and, and it could happen tomorrow or it can happen 500 years from now. What does it matter? This, and I told myself, it just simply can't happen. So I came home knowing that I felt I have felt like I had a cause, right? Like this is the reason why as a Yanomami, I was not raised in the jungles. I was raised in the Western world. This is the reason why I did all this hard work in my education and so on. So I need founded the Good Project, which is a nonprofit organization, um, you know, obviously with friends um, and, and coworkers and colleagues. And we're dedicated to just that, you know, supporting Yanomami programs in, in their health, right? Combating, you know, spreads of, of, of infectious disease that were introduced. We're supporting, um, you know, uh, uh, intercultural education uh, and we're supporting um, cultural preservation, you know, uh, and using, you know, uh, various tools to be able to preserve their culture and their mythologies. And then of course we're engaged in, in microbiome research, which is a fairly new, you know, element of our, of our, of our work. You're now living in Canada. Yes. And, yeah. And, and, and one of the most pressing national conversations that we're having here is reconciliation with Canada's Aboriginal peoples. In your view, what can we learn from the Yanomami in terms of our relationship with the Inuit, Métis, and First Nation peoples of Canada? Well, the Yanomami are in a very unique position uh, because, you know, they have largely been spared by the destructions of colonialism, industrialization, and, you know, um, and that's what makes, you know, them quite unique. And you know, even my colleague, Hortense, who's an anthropologist, has studied the Yanomami for 30 years, and, and she does UN projects around the world and, 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 in, and in countries and communities that have been affected by oil spills. And she said, you know, of all the work that I've been doing, the, um, there's nothing as special as I've ever observed, you know, as the, as the Upper Orinoco with the Yanomami. And what they have is just so precious. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, learning from the history of what, you know, the Canadian, U.S. and other, you know, around the world governments have done to the indigenous people, you know, this idea of reconciliation is not just about, you know, throwing money at them and saying sorry. It's about, you know, understanding the diverse cultures and humanities and understanding the different realities and different ways we see life, the different ways, the, all the knowledge and wisdom that these indigenous people have that could be, you know, that's critical, crucial for, for I believe, for human survival and, and, and peace. Um, there's nobody knows the Amazon rainforest. No biologist, no researcher, no anthropologist, no scientist could ever have an understanding of the Amazon rainforest like the Yanomami people do. Every leaf, every stick, every ant, every animal, every body of water. 
So there's a certain knowledge and wisdom that the Yanomami have that didn't just happen overnight. It came from thousands and thousands of years of learning and learning. I mean, they are scientists, right? They learn mm -hmm. and they, you know, make mistakes and so on. And I don't, you know, with, with what's happened historically to other indigenous peoples around the world, you know, um, they, I, I feel that, you know, this, the reconciliation process is great, but let's, let's also bolster and try to, you know, uh, um, regain that indigenous knowledge because it will benefit all of humanity for sure. We in Canada like to think of ourselves as quite distinct from our American neighbors. Uh, <laughs> but now you're someone who's, you know, almost uniquely uh, uh, accustomed to, to two very, very different cultures. And having growing up, grown up in the States and now, and now living in Canada, uh, have you noticed any differences? Or, or, or is this like a point of pride that, uh, for us Canadians that we're, we're, really just, we're really just fooling ourselves? I, I, yeah. I, I would love to get your, your opinion and your insights on Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. It's funny. It's just like, okay, you know, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm Yanomami, you know, with a Venezuelan passport. I was born and raised in the United States and is now going to school in Canada. So, um, it, you know, I always thought I would go south, but, you know, um, what brought me to Canada, there's many reasons why that brought me to Canada, but, um, I, you know, I just moved here less than a year ago and, and I'm still learning. Um, I admit, you know, there's, I, I am quite embarrassed that Canada is only like six hours away from where I lived and there's much I don't know about its geography or political history. Um, but, uh, I, I really, you know, first of all, uh, I'm so happy to be studying here. You know, the, the community that I found myself in at University of Guelph, uh, the community that I found myself with, with my friends and colleagues, you know, in Guelph, is just phenomenal. And I always thought, wow, why didn't I move here sooner? So I'm really happy to be in Canada. I'm really happy to be in this process of learning to be, you know, Canadian in, in, in its respect by learning the culture and, um, and its history. Uh, and I hope maybe someday, you know, who knows, maybe I'll end up after I get a postdoc in Canada or maybe I'll end up just teaching there, you know, afterwards. Mm -hmm. but, and, and, what, um, and what are you studying here? Uh, I study micro, I'm doing my PhD in microbiology at University of Guelph. Okay. And uh, I, l last question. Uh, what's next for you? You've uh, you've done quite a bit, and you're still a relatively young man. Uh, you're getting a PhD, and and what are what are what are your plans for the next uh, next few years? Next few years, yeah, I still continue my PhD work, but my plans are, um, you know, to build, uh, um, well, you know, to to continue bolster uh, bolstering our support with the Yanomami. So I am going to make at least one or two return expeditions um to to my village um and to visit my mom and uh you know it's funny because i have to say you know in order to visit my mom i actually have to mount a full-scale expedition because <laughs> i have to fly to venezuela and then I have another flight from caracas to puerto ayacucho and then from puerto ayacucho i have to fly to la esmeralda then i have to get on a boat and go about three four days up the orinoco river and then i have to cross the guajaripo rapids and seven and there are times where i got swept by the rackets there's times where our boat almost capsized so after we we, you know, successfully shoot the rapids. I have to go, you know, two, three more hours up the river, and hopefully I can find my mom because my mom is a semi-nomadic hunter-gatherer. I never know where she is. So, you know. No fixed address. <laughs> <laughs> right so maybe it might be a trek day or two into the jungle to find her she might be on the river we don't know um and so you know um uh, and that's what it takes to go down there. But, you know, uh, for me, I feel very blessed that I have this position where, you know, I have the resources to go not only visit my mom, but to partake in, you know, these programs where um, I can continually, you know, support, uh, um, you know, the Yanomami people and then to continue my research in microbiome. And, and that's a big part of what I'll be doing the next few years is, is studying and characterizing uh, the, the microbiome of my family. That's great. Well, uh, I, I really want to thank you, David, for, for, for taking the time. If people want to support the Good Project or support the Yanomanami people, how would they how would they do so? Yeah, uh, you check out our website. It's jointhegoodproject.org. 
and there you can make a uh, donation online or you can you get the details if you want to send us a check or money order and um you know uh we would gratefully you know uh, um, appreciate all support that we can get to grow our small nonprofit um so that we can you know help protect the Yanomami people and, and help protect the Amazon because, hey, we all need it, right? The Amazon's important for us in Canada. It's important for, you know, everyone around the world. And, and the Yanomami people are the best conservationists. You know, if we want to protect the Amazon, let's help the Yanomami. Yeah. Amazon, the lungs of the planet. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Any any last thoughts? Uh, yeah, any last thoughts? Wow. Well, I, I mean, I want to, I am very grateful for this opportunity to share the uh, world of the Yanomami, you know, to you and to our followers and listeners, um, because I believe that the more you get to know of people, you know, the similarities far outweigh the differences. And when you think about the Yanomami, it's more than just knowing about, learning about them uh, in the headlines or this kind of global view. Like, I want you to think about, you know, get to the ground level, get in the Shabano, Think about how do the Yanomami laugh? How do they cry? How do they die? How do they give birth? Let's create a human connection with them. And because, hey, we share the same planet. So, you know, um, let's learn. I would even appreciate if you just learn something about the Yanomami, anything. That's great. Well, thanks very much. This has been fascinating. I really appreciate you taking the time today. Hey, thank you so much for having me. It's great. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Links for today's discussion can be found in the show notes. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please subscribe and engage in the conversation. Comment, rate, and review. Email us at podcast at centerforinquiry.ca. We'd love to hear your perspective. The Podcast for Inquiry is brought to you by the Center for Inquiry Canada. We rely entirely on donations to be your voice supporting science, free inquiry, critical thinking, and secularism here in Canada. To our supporters, thank you. If you have not yet contributed, please consider making a donation today at centerforinquiry.ca slash donate or becoming a member for only $30 per year at centerforinquiry.ca slash join. Your contribution supports our efforts to have reason and evidence drive decision-making everywhere. CFIC is on the web at centerforinquiry.ca. We are on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at CFI Canada. Podcast for Inquiry is produced and edited by Matt Payne, Nikolay Nikitushkin, and Martin Zielinski. Music by Anthony Lazaro. I'm your host, Leslie Rosenblatt. See you next time.